Hi, everyone. This is Jason Biarrack of Wall Street for Mean Street. Welcome back to another Wall Street for Mean Street podcast interview. Today's special guest is a returning guest. I try to have him on a number of times each year. He is a silver guru. He has decades of market experience. He writes the Morgan Report. He's the author of Silver Manifesto and also The Skinny on Silver. He's the CEO of Lemuria Royalty, which is a new precious metal royalty company. And for most importantly, he got me interested in silver in 2007, 2008 with his Financial Sense interviews. David Morgan, thank you for joining me again. Well, Jason, it's great to be with you. Thank you. Now, David, there's so much news going on in the gold and silver markets. Uh, it's It's been a good last week, I would say, for people who are worried that you know the price was going to get smashed and collapsed. We have this brought physical silver trust announcing a pretty large buy of 5 million ounces of physical silver. Uh, since you know the silver market a lot better than me, you know all the different levels of the supply chain. Uh, how hard is it to source 5 million ounces of silver for our listeners out there? Well, believe it or not, I mean, I've got a feel for it, as you said, but no one really knows uh, until you make the order. Uh, I'll be writing about this in the next Morgan Report, but I was actually, you know, shoulder to shoulder with Eric as they were doing the original prospectus. And we did a silver swap, and I say that as an inside joke because uh, I had given him a couple of coins and a couple of his uh, the people that were there at the table with us some uh, privately minted silver rounds that uh, have silver-investor.com on them. And he gave me one of their Sprout coins, so we made a joke of that. But moving on, uh, that first one was quite a story on that initial purchase. And then sometime later, and I believe it was over a year, but not much longer than a year, I'd have to look it up, and I will, and I'll report on it. But uh, that was a different animal. And this time, you know, we're looking at the uh, press release from uh, Toronto, Ontario, Canada, April 8, 2016, and it states that they're going to put an offering out of just a cat's whisker under $75 million. And if you break that into, you know, $16 silver, you're looking at approximately 5 million ounces. So is 5 million ounces <clears throat> a big deal in today's silver world? The answer is no, it's not, which means when you're looking at a, you know, 1 billion ounce uh, per year uh, amount of silver from both mining and recycling, uh, you know, 5 million is not a very big number. However, all markets move at the margin. We don't know how tight and strongly held the silver above ground is right now. I have a sense it's much tighter than most think, or maybe or, uh, someone that doesn't know much about the silver market, which means, you know, just based on those numbers, you'd say, oh, well, geez, that's, that's nothing. However, knowing that uh, silver investors, particularly even more so than gold investors, tend to buy and hold, and it's uh, it's very very diverse with, because there's so many you know small silver stackers out there that have bought you know in the 30s, 25s, 20s, you know, and lower, and they're not about to sell you know at 16. So it'll remain to be determined. Uh, I think it will be a little tighter than many again might uh, estimate based on the numbers I just gave. Now, this the, the timing of this broad offering, it seems to be about perfect timing because, you know, the commitment I had heard you and in other interviews and other gold and silver experts, Clyde Mond and others who look at the charts, talk about the commitment of traders was bearish in the short term and things like that. Then this offering comes in to, you know, potentially make things more difficult to source the physical silver. So it seems this was well timed in order to counter uh, any bearish sentiment in the short term for traders. I agree, and I'd like to do a shout out to uh, Rob Kirby. Rob was doing an interview, I think it was on the USA Watchdog uh, interview with Greg Hunter, is my recollection, and he said that there would be some pretty big news in the uh, precious metals markets in the not too distant future, and that uh, interview was not very long ago, and here we are with what we're going to talk about next, but you're talking about the timing of this. I think it's nearly perfect. I mean, I, had, I talked to John Embry on a pretty regular basis. And, you know, I mentioned to John more than once, and I already know, you know, his answer, but geez, wouldn't it be nice if somebody bought some physical silver in this range, meaning, you know, in these low, you know, below 20, I mean, the 18s, 17s, 16s, even 15s. And the problem for PSLV and almost all of them is they have to have something above their net asset value in order to pull it off because there are expenses that are incurred when you make an offering there's legal work and all this other stuff so you can't do an offering if the your fund or your trust or your holding company is below net asset value you're going to lose money and 
it's you know you just can't float the uh, the offering. So PSLV has been in uh, a positive NAV or positive to the net asset value, and as you said, perfect timing. And I think it's going to put kind of a floor into the silver price. I mean, again, five million ounces isn't like a huge amount. But it's a huge amount when you factor it by a factor of 100 or 200 or whatever in the derivative of the world. In other words, you know, people that have never traded futures or worked in the options market or whatever don't really seem to appreciate what leverage really means. Leverage is wonderful when it's working for you. And it's a really unbelievably strict master if it's going against you. So you take 5 million ounces off a highly leveraged derivative dependent market like the silver market and it is a lot more than you know that what, what would appear basis you know what all global, global mining activity is on an annual basis and what the recycling market is on an annual basis hope i made that clear because i think it's important for everyone that listens to shows like yours and I think almost all of them do, but there's always new people that, you know, like, well, I, you know, I don't get it. And not that I explained it that well, but at least I put out the idea and hopefully succinctly enough that the leverage in these markets is very, very extreme. And the metals markets in particular uh, versus most other markets. I mean, money trades in these kind of derivatives and these kind of leverages. You know, if you look at the currency markets and you look at the exposure on what the ratios are derivative wise to quote unquote physical, which isn't in, really in the currency markets, but we, we pretend there are with M1 as an example. That same ratio applies to gold and silver, but no other commodities, which means that the market determines that gold and silver are money regardless of what anyone says. Now, David, this this five million ounce purchase is not as large as Sprott's initial purchase for the, for the Sprott Physical Silver Trust. And that initial purchase, we had heard stories about how you know they they had claimed the there was plenty of above ground silver to fund that initial purchase of the PSLV. But Sprott was getting bars that were minted, you know, after he had started or uh, trying to fill the order for the for the PSLV. Um, Sprott also filed an additional shelf offering to do. To do to do more capital raises like this one, uh, he has more ammo. I think besides just this 75 million capital raise, he can do additional offerings, right, without having to file additional prospectuses in the future. That's correct. And if I recall correctly, and I have a pretty good memory, it was 500 million, and I think they did it once, maybe since then. Uh, and this would be the second one, or this may be the first one since then. So yes, you do have a lot of ammunition left. Yeah, I think this is the first one in the addition, the secondary shelf. So he has plenty of ammunition left to time it, uh, to time it how he wants to. So this is offset, you know, the commit, the bearishness on the commitment of traders and things like that. In my opinion, now I want to transition to the story that uh, you alluded to earlier in the interview. And actually, I think Rob Kirby had been hinting at this, you know, for for months now that there was a big story breaking. But we finally got this. Uh, Zero Hedge broke it. I don't know if you've seen it on the mainstream media or not. I I, I haven't. But Deutsche Bank has finally admitted to gold and silver manipulation. Uh, it was from a class action lawsuit who's uh, on Wall, a Wall Street lawyer who's done this before. And they are not only are they going to name other big bullion banks that were involved in the manipulation, they are as part of their settlement, they are going to have to turn over evidence. Uh, in terms of your reaction to this news, do you think this is small news for the precious metals market or is this um, you know, medium-sized news or big news, where do you think this fits in the spectrum then in terms of how big of a news this is? Well, the only way I can really answer that because I am biased is it, it's going to be all three of those depending on who's looking at it. You know, it's, it's what are your interests. But for those in the silver community, I think it's huge. For those in the gold, precious metals community, it's certainly very big. For those in the economic mainstream, it's a ho-hum unless it affects them in some indirect way. And for the general public, it's a non sequitur. It means nothing to them. They, well, well, what does that mean? Manipulation, everything's manipulated or they believe nothing's manipulated. But coming back to my take on it, I definitely want to see something in the mainstream. Uh, you know, Zero Hedge is certainly uh, one of the sites I look at, you know, almost daily. I mean, the only time I don't is if I'm traveling or, you know, don't have the ability to get to a phone or a computer or something. But this is a rather large thing, especially if you examine, you know, what was reported on the internet, which is not only is Deutsche Bank going to pony up some money, 
they're also going to help with the investigation with the other parties that are involved, which according to this article are HSBC and Scotia. And uh, neither one of those banks are very, you know, on the, on the big hit parade for me. I don't care for either one of them. So a lot to be determined. Of course, we'll be following the story and I'll be writing about this in the next issue. And I think there'll be more to come out. I think one of the in more interesting things is how will this backfire on the CFTC? Because anyone that's followed, you know, my work, Fast Head B, uh, GATA, uh, you look at uh, Ed Steer, I mean, Rob Kirby, I mean, there's so many out there that have said, you know, there is something going on in these markets. And for years, uh, you know, Silver's had probably more investigations, at least at the public level, where the public was aware of it than anything else. And we always get, you know, some written statement that's, that's basically, you know, nothing here, move along. But I want to be very fair here because, you know, I have some personal emails from Bart Chilton that I'll be putting in the next Morgan report that are, you know, pretty spot on as far as I'm concerned. I believe them to be sincere. But uh, the last closing statement, uh, you know, on this last investigation by the CFTC was based upon the law and evidence as they exist at this time. So right there, that's legal talk that at this time. So in other words, if something happens in the future, they've kind of left themselves an opening. So they're not going to box themselves in. These lawyers are smart and they're supposed to be smart and that's legal ease. So I just interpreted it for you. I think you didn't need my interpretation, but I did it anyway. Comma. I, I, have, there, I have a semester of law school, David. So yeah. <laughs> I'm a dropout though of law school. <laughs> well, I just did some contract law. I got an A in the class, but that doesn't make me a lawyer anyway. There is not a viable basis to bring an enforcement action with respect to any firm or the employees related to our investigation of, of silver markets. But there again, let's interpret that a little bit. There is not a viable basis to bring an enforcement action. Doesn't mean there wasn't any manipulation. Doesn't mean there wasn't something going on. Doesn't mean that this, that, and the other thing was found by the investigation. What it means is from a legal perspective only, there wasn't a viable basis to bring an enforcement action. And I pounded the table on that at the time not because I'm siding with the CFTC, quite the contrary. I was just trying to bring an awareness to the silver community, the precious metals community, the law community, whoever's interested in this type of thing, that they were leaving themselves an opening. And they also weren't saying there is no manipulation, which of course is what most people on the internet said. Oh, they said there's none. No, they didn't say that. They said they don't have enough evidence basically okay. to bring an enforcement yep. action. Well, what happens now? Do they have enough evidence now? Uh, I don't know. What I do know is this, in my view, so coming back to your original question, I'm gonna answer it a second time. How big is this gonna be? No one knows, but my, my guess would be with all the suppression that's happened for people that have had, let's say an ax to grind the silver market because they felt that they were um, mishandled in their uh, purchase of silver, either in a physical market or in a secondary market or in the derivatives markets, uh, are not probably going to sit there and just take it. They're probably going to want something uh, further to take place in this market. So this thing could go, could grow, could get very big. Uh, I don't think it's going to go away quickly. I don't think it's going to go away easily. I think this is, you know, to use the overused metaphor, this may have opened Pandora's box. We'll just have to wait and see, Jason. Yeah, I agree. It's going to take some time to go through the evidence because they're going to be handing over large amounts. I was reading through the Zero Hedge article. I don't have it open now because Zero Hedge crashed my browser. Unfortunately, I have to install a new ad blocker. <laughs> but, um, you know, they're going to be handing over instant messages. They're going to be handing over lots of emails. You know, this could go back way over a decade worth of emails. That's a lot of emails to go through, David, between traders and, and different investment banks and things like that. So this could be, you know, literally uh, years worth of evidence. This could take a long time for it to get out through the discovery process. Also, the other point you brought up is the legal definition of proof. Uh, uh, you know, the burden of proof in a legal trial for a criminal case, normally it's beyond a reasonable doubt. Uh, whereas in a civil civil case, it's different. You know, it's 50, they, 
they talk they say it's 51 percent in a civil trial but you know for a criminal case it's beyond a reasonable doubt which they consider you know 91 percent uh, uh in order to prove your case you have to have uh, legal proof of 91 percent basically so there's a huge discrepancy there that's how the lawyers you know get a lot of these guys out of charges and things like that Exactly. Well, you know, we've got a whole chapter in the Silver Manifesto, and I think, you know, it's uh, something that, uh, you know, we spent a lot of time going over on the probability theory and what the, you know, the math would be in a situation that's, you know, well beyond a reasonable doubt percentage-wise, uh, and that's just one aspect. I want to make a further comment you didn't ask me about, but, you know, there's a lot out there in the community that, you know, in a manipulated market, technical analysis doesn't work. You know, the first thing I would do if I was called as an expert witness uh, would be to use technical analysis. I would use it to verify to anybody that was sitting on the jury that didn't understand these markets how they work, and I think a chart would be worth 10,000 words, you know, the picture's worth 1,000, This because it would show what the volumes are, what the price movements are, and then you could relate that to what the physical ability of the market is, and I think it's unbelievable. I mean, I'm not like super on charts. I still use them. I still believe that they are a good tool. Are they perfect? No, but uh, certainly useful. But a lot of people that, you know, kind of make fun of them, uh, or say they're useless are usually people that haven't spent the time, effort, dedication to learn all that's involved with doing correct technical work. Uh, there's some really great uh, brain trusts out there that do use technical analysis. Most these days that I know of are not pure TAs, not pure technical analysis uh, types. Uh, they use fundamentals and technicals like I do. I think it's important to know both. But sorry for the little rant. But um, no, that's I, that's fine. You're you're disclosing your investing methodology. I think that's important for people to understand because you know people who are just Warren Buffett value investors who look at you know discounted cash flows and dividend stocks and things like that are going to be different than people only look at charts. But yeah, I, I, I use a combination of both. Although I prefer you know in the long run fundamentals tend to win out. Definitely agreed. Now, speaking of fundamentals, David, I want to transition to the fundamentals of supply and demand for the silver market. Uh, there's There was a, a report out from Society General, or SOCGEN, as it's called um, you know, in finance. They say that silver supply is going to go down by 9% in 2016 and by 13% in 2017 due to low base metal prices, and a lot of silver is going to come off line from the mines there as a byproduct, I guess. Uh, do you agree with their analysis of uh, the silver supply for that, or do you think it's too high or too low? Well, definitely on a fundamental basis, as we just talked about, yes, it is going to decrease. They sound about right. We haven't run the numbers yet, and as you know, Chris usually does, does that t kind of uh, you know analysis, so we get a percentage. But that does sound about right. The other thing is this kind of debate about whether or not uh, you know we're in a deficit or surplus, and that's really kind of a tough call because uh, Steve San Angelo, who I'll probably invite on for our mastermind group for our website members this month, you know, goes through a lot of articles about using basically uses the uh, Silver Institute study and and it speaks about the CPM study. Uh, I've, I've gotten both for years and years and years. In fact, as old as I am, I go back to the Handy Hardman days when that was Handy and Hardman put out the, uh, the annual reports on the silver market. But anyway, I'm off topic. Back on point, we uh, look at both and you know, to be try to be fair, try to be objective, silver supply got to its, and I did a webinar on this, by the way. I'm doing these webinars probably once a month for the public. Uh, you got to sign up. You've got to log in. You can ask a question or two, and then I cut it off, and uh, we post it uh, for members only on for the website members. But the general public is allowed to come on uh, for, the, for the first one. And the whole system is that the lowest point we got was probably 2006, roughly 500 million ounces. Where are we now in above ground silver supply? About 2 billion ounces. Where do we start in 1990 before the 16 year deficit or shortage actually took place? We were at 2 billion ounces. So we went from 2 billion ounces in the year 1990 down to 500 million, so roughly 100 million ounces deficit for 16 years in a row, Jason. We hit the bottom, and from 2006 roughly till now, we have been building in the inventories. So, you know, to try to, again, be objective, if you go to the Jeff Christian story, he's saying that there has been, quote unquote, a surplus. 
you have to agree that the overall above ground stockpiles have built up by 1.5 billion ounces in the last 10 years from 2006 to through 2016 to where we are right now. On the other hand, you can side with uh, Steve St. Angelo and say, if you look at investment demand as demand, and I do, then we've been running a deficit. So, you know, how do you want to explain it? I mean, I would explain it, as I said earlier, really the above ground stockpiles are, are growing and have been for some time, 10 years. But if that scares anybody away from the silver market, uh, I apologize because it shouldn't. I mean, if you use that same exact analysis to the gold market, no one would ever buy gold because the inventories always has been increasing. The above ground supply of gold continually increases. And yet it becomes you know, very valuable at times in paper money terms and not so valuable in paper money terms. Gold is a constant. An ounce of gold is an ounce of gold. An ounce of silver is an ounce of silver. Those are the constants. What varies is what is the paper quote unquote price on that given uh, fixed amount. And that's of course something that can be debated from now forever. But uh, right now I think the, the bottom has been in for a while. And the silver story, I think, is going to have, you know, more legs than uh, we might expect. And then again, I could be wrong. We might see, you know, a few things come out and, um, uh, you know, it dies off quickly. But as many people that have been burned in these markets, especially on the silver side, I don't think it's going away. I think it's going to, uh, it's going to be some internet, you know, there'll be a lot on the internet about it. I think what I'm going to do is I'll do some interviews like yours. Uh, but I plan to just write my thoughts in the Morgan Report on it. I want to get my thoughts out there because it's such an emotional metal. And if someone doesn't agree with you, uh, especially on the internet, you know, it's like they can, you know, try to tear you apart and whatever. And that's fine. People can be people. I don't mind. It's just, uh, you know, I've been in this market for a long time. And I certainly don't know it all, but I certainly have good contacts. I've certainly worked hard. And I certainly try to be objective about it. I can't. I'm biased. I'm for honest money for the people. But this is something that um, it's going to be very interesting, I think, to watch it going forward. You don't know it all, David, but you know more than almost any other gold and silver expert about the silver metal. And the Silver Manifesto is an excellent book for our listeners out there. It's available on audiobook. I gave it a five-star review on Audible. I actually normally don't write reviews, but I enjoyed your book since it talks about Austrian school economics and how to invest in silver companies and things like that. So I think it's worthy of, of our listeners going out and getting it. But you brought up an interesting point there on the supply side. You know, the last 10 or 15 years, as the silver price has risen, we've seen more marginal silver mines come online with the higher copper price, you know, the last 15 or 20 years, the copper price went from 15, uh, excuse me, 50 cents to like over $4 at one point. That's a lot of copper and base metals that have come online that have brought silver as base metal byproducts online as well. So, you know, that's a lot of extra supply that has also come online. But to match that, we've had enormous growth in demand as well. There's been enormous industrial demand growth on um, on the side for solar and so many other electronics. And the investment demand for physical silver has also grown a lot too. So this is just, you know, compared to when 10, 15 years ago, this is, I think, a much larger silver market than it was 10 or 15 years ago. Oh, absolutely. No, you're spot on. I'm glad you brought it up and you said it very well. I mean, you can't, you know, you cannot freeze anything that's as dynamic as, as a market, stock market, commodity market, whatever, and make, you know, blanket statement. But, you, but you're right. The comparison is very accurate. I mean, first of all, you know, look at the growth in the silver market from like 2000 to, say, 2008. I mean, at that time, uh, in the 2000s or early, late 90s, silver's industrial use was 35% of the market. Today, it's about 54%. And that's in a market that grew from 2000 to 2010, 11, 12, you know. So it went from 35% to 55% round numbers. And at the same time, the market was growing pretty darn strongly, 2 to 3% a year compounded for quite a while. And now it's flattened out from about that time frame. Why? don't know exactly. I'll admit I don't know everything. 
basically what it looks like from our analysis or mine is that uh, we're kind of saturated in the electronics world. You know, I mean, everyone that wants an iPhone's got the six or the five or whatever they want. Uh, same thing on the Android side. And then these phones are now recycled. I mean, I used to say in early 2000, it wasn't worth getting the silver out of a flip phone. And that's true, it wasn't. But a smartphone has gold in it and they're worth about three grams per ton, which is better well, than some of the gold mines out there. Yeah, there's rare earths too in those smartphones, and the dysprosium alone was selling for three thousand a ton, I think it was, or kil three. Excuse me, three thousand a kilogram. The dysprosium, the rare earths. So yeah, there was gold and there's precious metals and rare earths, high value rare earths in those smartphones. Exactly. Uh, now, David, there's also a lot of silver consumed though too. So you know, a lot of that silver in electronics, besides just iPhones, it's also in nano spray and. And I think you brought up in your research, it's now sprayed on food to uh, to reduce the amount of, uh, uh, in, not insects, Pathogen. I want to say. Pathogen. Yes, pathogens. Yes. Yeah. So they put it in clothing, they spray it on food to eliminate, you know, any viruses or anything like that or, or. Uh, well, I want to transition now to the gold and silver miners. This is something the Morgan Report covers probably about as good as any any uh, newsletter in the, in your industry. You guys cover all in sustaining production costs. The miners here, it seems to me, you know, they've had a rough go of it since 2011 with falling gold and silver prices and high oil prices, but things have kind of reversed the last year or so. You think the miners are in a sweet spot now where they have temporarily lower oil prices, higher gold and silver prices in uh, other developing market currencies and their margins are are starting to really improve? Absolutely. Uh, the, uh, the undervaluation of the overall gold and silver stocks is phenomenal even now. I mean, they got to such a an undervaluation compared to what they're really worth. It was a point of ridiculousness and certainly uh, we were very much, you know, pounding the table and then it went lower and pounded the table harder and then it went even lower. And that's one of the reasons that we started, you know, this company that I'm the CEO on. But this is uh, an opportunity. And even as much as the HUI as an index has moved, uh, there's a lot more of the upside. We might get a pause here. I just did an update for our website members and uh, looking at the charts and the amount of uh, sentiment right now, it's pretty bullish in our community. Uh, but if you bought this level and it went down, you know, 20% or whatever, uh, and just held, you'd be fine. I mean, as long as you don't use any leverage or margin in here, uh, you're gonna do fine. And of course, there are times you can use it. I'm not saying, you know, I'm free market. If you wanna use it, use it. But uh, we have got something, I think, that is going into the financial record books as these currency markets start to unravel further and further. I mean, as we know, we don't need to get on a topic be a whole another half hour, but there's so much going on in these debt markets and what's going on with these banks. And I find it rather amusing and not in a funny way, but in a realistic way that here it is, uh, Deutsche Bank with this problem. And anyone that knows the banking system knows this is one of the worst banks, probably totally insolvent on a solvency basis. And now they've got the silver market manipulation legal settlement. So again, interesting times. Now we started to see a handful of mergers and acquisitions. Uh, do you think sentiment, since you go to mining conferences, do you think the CEOs, the, the ones who have run more prudent mid-tier mining companies, not the ones who took on too much debt or did bad acquisitions near the top of the gold and silver markets in 2011, do you think the ones who are more prudent, the mid-tier guys who had cash and had you know lower costs and were making money you know all the way down, do you think these guys are going to be more opportunistic going forward and making acquisitions soon? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I'm not going to say much. I'm going to write about it in the next report, but uh, it's funny, and it really is funny. I mean, la laughable how fast sentiment can change at that level. Uh, let's say for you know the girl that nobody wants to ask to the prom to everybody and his brother-in-law wants to ask her to the prom. I mean, it's that's maybe a corny analogy, but it's accurate. It's really changed rapidly. I want to transition to the royalty and streaming company industry. Uh, I guess, you know, with the SEC stuff, you don't, don't want to talk about your company specifically, but why do you think royalty and streaming companies have a durable competitive advantage in the long term compared to, you know, regular primary gold and silver miners? Well, Jason, you could speak to that as well as I can. I mean, why don't you go ahead and just tell people, you know, what the benefits are of a streaming company because, of the, you know, 
the risk is pretty well defined. There's very little downside. Uh, the streaming company makes a profit. Uh, regardless of how much it takes the uh, partner to pull it out of the ground, it could be, in other words, uh, the relationship could be that the person producer or the mine that's producing the product could be producing at a loss, but the uh, streaming company still gets the product at a fixed price. So there's lots of reasons why the risk reward ratio is so extremely positive and why, you know, we have the loyal membership that we do is because we have looked at companies that produce profit. Uh, at our also secured, you know, in the precious metals arena, for the most part. I mean, I rebranded the Morgan Report to make it very clear that we look at, you know, lithium, copper, molybdenum, uh, you know, drilling companies. We have an energy stock in there. Um, you know, we're looking in, out in the future to the financial uh, technology industry because, you know, we really need competition to Deutsche Bank. We really need something, and I think something – more than Bitcoin, I'm going to get the Bitcoin lovers mad at me, but um, we need something in the financial technology arena that gives true competition to the banking establishment as we know it. Well said, David. I, I do like Bitcoin, but uh, it's not large enough of a market yet to do financing for mining companies and things like that quite yet. Now, maybe in the future it will be, but, you know, not yet. Um, in, in terms of the uh, royalty and streaming companies, you know, you named a lot of the reasons why it's better, but they've been just so aggressive when the gold and silver price was low because they had cheaper cost of capital. They had more free cash flow. And so they were really aggressive trying to do deals uh, with, you know, miners who had bad balance sheets or or a new low cost mine that had been discovered or things like that. Exactly. Well said. And, you know, we're in a situation where we think the market has, has turned or is turning or is about to. And uh, there are a lot of, um, let's say, distressed projects for the reasons you outlined. So we're going to fit into a niche that probably no one else has because the large ones like your Franco Nevadas and your Silver Wheatons would not be going after small situations that we'd be able to. Yeah, that's a good point. And if the market does have, you know, a brief temporary correction, that's very painful. The royalty and streaming companies who have free cash flow, I think they'll just do another round of big deals. <laughs> yeah, probably. Yeah, whereas, you know, the min the miners will be forced to in order to survive. So, you know, like not everyone's backed by a billionaire like Rob McEwen that can afford to finance their companies like that. So, you know, in the real world, these miners that don't that aren't backed by billionaires, they have tough decisions to survive. Yeah. Uh, well, I want to I want to get your thoughts on Mexican silver miners. Uh, you know, uh, Steve St. Angelo is saying that Mexican silver miners have decreased production. But, you know, when we look at the uh, first Majestic Silver and some of the other guys, they've increased production. Uh, do you think then that Mexican silver miners uh, with a weak peso are going to keep uh, increasing production if they can? Mm, good question. Obviously, I give my standard answer, which you have to look at a case by case basis basis. But uh, generally, I think, yes, I think they will. Um, unfortunately, you know, with the paper paradigm that we all live in, most of the miners live in the paper paradigm. I remember speaking at the uh, Silver Institute's conference when they used to invite me to speak. And, you know, I always talked about the monetary side or primarily, I mean, I did my whole speech, but a lot of it had to do with the monetary side, which no one else at those conferences even touches or dares to touch. And most of the uh, Mexican contingency that was at that particular year's uh, gathering uh, gave me a very wide berth. They were not really comfortable hearing about the monetary aspects of silver, especially uh, you know, from my perspective. And I could go on, I won't, because it touches on some friends of mine that are well known in the silver world in Mexico, and let's say not no, uh, not. <clears throat> particularly well liked by the mining community. I, I want to transition then to another topic. Uh, recently, I guess, the Northwest Territorial Mint, there's been, you know, bankruptcy or they're going through the proceedings right now. There's also in the last couple of years been other uh, precious metal bullion dealers that have had troubles, you know, going out of bank, uh, going out of business, not filling orders, etc. How can our listeners out there, you know, avoid this pitfall of wanting to go out and buy physical gold or silver and, you know, making sure that they buy from a reputable dealer? Yeah, very good. Well, you know, I, I made it my one of my missions really or submission to try as a public service or a public service announcement to put the 10 rules of silver investing up for everyone for free. I used to, in the very, very early days, use it as kind of a premium to subscribing to the Morgan Report. 
And I thought better of it. I thought, you know, everyone should have the ability to get these 10 rules. So anyone that signs up for our free e-letter would get the 10 rules. And I expanded on them. I, you know, had written them originally for the Investing Rules book. And, you know, such notables as uh, Sir John Templeton are in that book. It's an honor just to be in there with someone like that. But regardless, uh, what I said is don't get a raw deal from your dealer. I've been around for so long that I know shopping price alone is not the way to go because sometimes people cut their margins too thin and they will go out of business and you, Mr. Investor, are left holding the bag. So don't get a raw deal from your dealer. Make sure that you deal with somebody that's had a long reputation, probably has a fair premium, and again, price alone. And then I gave the caveat or the common sense, just think about it. If you're going to buy the best price dealer or whomever, start small. If you're going to put in 10,000 bucks in the precious metals, start with 1,000. Now, I know there's dealers out there that won't take that size order, but there's many that will. And find out, you know, how long does it take to get your product? How's it packaged? Uh, if there's a problem and you call, were you treated nicely? Uh, is there a tracking, uh, you know, is there a way to track it? All these things. But unfortunately, you know, the metals are such an emotional market. And I'm going to just drift off into one story. But I got a consultation call years ago from a uh, Asian gentleman. And his parents had migrated from China. And they heard the silver story from whomever. I don't think it was me, but it could have been. They read it, I think, on the internet. And they put a half a million dollars into the silver market. And they bought what's called semi-numismatic coins. And there is no such thing, really. Oh, it's a big switch. gimmick. It's a real sham. And, of course, I've known about this forever. And so he told me what had happened to him. And they basically paid 40% more than they could liquidate them for. The good part of the story is it was at like at $7 silver. So I gave him some, you know, ideas of what I would do if I were in that situation and how to you know, handle it. And they actually came out okay. But, you know, rather than buy, you know, I'm, I'm going to put in half a million dollars in precious metals. Don't you think you put in like 50000 to start with? But they just put in everything. And this happens. I, that's not the only call I've gotten over the years. I mean, I've gotten some from, you know, pretty large business owners that uh, said they wish they would have read my 10 rules of silver investing, where I recommend, you know, 10% for most people, 20% if you're a real silver bug. And he goes, geez, I wish I would have read that because, you know, I've got everything in the silver market at, you know, 28. And now, you know, it's sitting here at 18. You know, what do I do? I know it's at 16 now. I'm just talking when I took the consultation call. And, you know, these are the kind of things that kind of drive me nuts because I really do want to help people. You know, life is, you know, best way to live life in my, after all the years I've been on the planet is balance. You know, you don't want to eat too much. You don't want to eat too little. You don't want to over-exercise or you don't want to under-exercise. That means a balance. And even in investing, you want to strike that balance. You know, I mean, I am certainly overloading the precious metals, but it's my expertise and I'm comfortable with it. And I've been through so many ups and downs on the silver market from the time I was in my like, you know, 18 years old that I can handle these big moves where most people are ready to, you know, jump out of the basement window or something. But I'm, you know, I'm okay with it. So, let me get back on point. I drifted way off there, but there's a, a note. <laughs> it's, on... I think it's a very valuable story, David. You know, people have to be careful not to jump in. That's like the gambler's mentality. People hear one thing and they think that they can, you know, get rich quick doing it. They have to be more careful, more prudent. If you're going to put half a million dollars into a market, you need to research the dealers, look at customer feedback, look at their reviews on Yelp, things like this. Unfortunately, David, I have a similar story for a consulting client too. He put hundreds of thousands of dollars into junior mining stocks when they're going up and didn't have downside protection on the way down. And there, there's been other, you know, sad stories too from other consulting clients of similar things. I want to add. You didn't have stop losses or puts or anything, yeah, any insurance. Yeah, I'm sure we're near the end of the year. I want to add one more. Here's one that all, you know, everyone should, you know, appreciate. I got a consultation call from somebody, and that 500,000 uh, number is uh, pitifully small relative to what this individual put in the silver market. And he called me. In fact, his comment was he had just uh, been the day before with Bill Gross. And anyone that's in the financial markets ought to know who that is or was. 
And he yep. was down there in Newport Beach with Bill. And the next day, he called me for a consultation pronto. And he basically said, I don't want to see it. I don't want to touch it. But I want this amount. And I want it. You know, I want it. I want to know it's there. And I said, well, that's interesting. Why me? And he goes, I trust you. I go, well, you don't really know me. But he goes, I know enough to know that, you know. So I put him in touch with, you know, on speed dial, basically, with one of the largest uh, approved warehouses that uh, exists. And I've toured the whole thing myself personally from front end to back end with the uh, founder of it. And he did the deal. And the whole uh, consultation, which is a half hour consultation, took about 15 minutes. But there's a guy that was going to put in that kind of size. And what did he do? He made damn sure that he picked the right dealer, right time, place, and condition, everything lined up. Plus, he had me, you know, as an intermediary. In other words, hey, wait a minute, buddy. You told me to get, go there kind of a thing. I had no qualms whatsoever, uh, you know, being the intermediary and setting him up and everything else. And I'm not suggesting that everyone call me as a consultation if they're going to buy silver. I mean, that's preposterous. But in some cases... It makes a lot of sense. Well put. Now, you also are affiliated, right, still with the Silver 123 and Silver Saver. That's for a dollar cost averaging if people want to put 50 or or $100 a month of gold and silver into uh, you know, storage, and then they could take delivery of that, right? Absolutely. It's a great program for the average person out there that really just wants to take an investor's mentality and a, a disciplined approach. And, you know, I've got uh, people close to me that do it and – don't really even think about it because once you set it up, it's on autopilot. And, you know, prices are low. You just keep buying at a low price. Prices, low, yep. you're buying less. That's a great way to do it. Yep, and you save in metal and you pay your bills in fiat and then uh, you be, you're your own personal central banker. And then, you know, with these uh, negative interest rates and bail-ins and bailouts and all the garbage that these uh, crazy Keynesian central bankers are, you know, planning on doing, uh, you're already uh, starting to get yourself out of the system. Exactly. Well, David, I just want to thank you again for your time today. The global economy, there's just so much evidence that things are imploding with the currencies and, you know, global trade and things like that. So I, I think, you know, if gold and silver, I think gold and silver have most likely bottom, but, you know, maybe we see a temporary correction. But, um, you know, I'm going to be looking to buy on the dip if there is one. Great. All right. Well, I'll just uh, plug the Morgan Report, please. Uh... Go by the new website, themorganreport.com. Give us the first name and your primary email address. I'll send you an 11-page report I just wrote a couple months ago, probably less than that. It's probably a month old called Riches and Resources. It has a link to the movie The Four Horsemen. That's the updated version that you can watch for free. Lots of good information that's valuable for nothing. And um, a little bit of promotion about The Morgan Report. Great. And uh, you also have your Lemuria Royalty where you're CEO and your book, Silver Manifesto. Uh, if our listeners want more information about your new royalty and streaming company, are, are you accepting investment from regular people or are you only private uh, placements right now? Yeah, right now that's being sorted through, but most likely at this point in time, it's only going to be Canadian investors. Okay, so if our listeners want more information on that, they should go to your uh, your new royalty website then. Yeah, I'm not see. sure they can even get information on it now. Uh, we had a long chat with the um, regulators on both sides, meaning the Canadian regulators and the United States regulators. I shouldn't say we had direct correspondence with the regulators. So let me rephrase that. We had correspondence with lawyers that are very familiar with Canadian regulators and U.S. regulators. And basis of the legal advice that we paid for, uh, we're probably going to just stick to Canada for now. Sounds like a migraine to me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, totally. yes, these type of uh, entities are always fun. Okay, great, David. Well, uh, hopefully there will be more positive news about the silver market in the future, and we'll have you back on to talk about it. I want to thank you again for your time today, and uh, you and Chris, keep up the great work. Well, thank you so much.